I'm not green, so <laughs> you guys had a tablet. I've got, you know, I've got my little notes here. A um, couple things. First of all, I'm a big fan of Creative Mornings. I've uh, been, been attending for the last few months. Uh, it's been great. Um, I'm a psychologist, um, so not someone who's typically thought of as part of the, necessarily the creative community. So uh, Creative Mornings is great. It's a great opportunity for me to interact with people who are different and um, have all kinds of great perspectives and, and are outside kind of my, my professional world a little bit. Um, so it's been really great. Um, and so uh, uh, thank you, Alicia and Stephen, uh, for the opportunity to, to participate today. Uh, I'll just echo something Emma said, which is um, I, I kind of wish I'd done this like six months ago. Um, because the bar just keeps getting like raised <laughs> like every week, you know, with um, Micah and Meredith and Matt and, and Brad and um, obviously what, um, what they did today. So, um, so I'll do my best. Uh, so uh, the, uh, I guess kind of the title I'm going to use is Inspiring Ourselves and Others uh, to Lead. Um, I wasn't always the most dedicated um, college student. Um, <laughs> Uh, the fall semester of my sophomore year of college, uh, I earned four D's and a B. And the D's were in uh, Introduction to Philosophy, Non-Western Politics, Social Psychology, and English Composition. My B was in Human Sexuality. Uh, it, it, was, it was the one class I attended fairly regularly. So, uh, we learn what we want to learn, we learn when we're ready to learn, right? Um, I've had an opportunity to teach at Vanderbilt as an adjunct, and, uh, and I'll tell you that some of my Vanderbilt students seemed um, more interested in earning an A than they were in learning. Um, they oftentimes seemed more competitive uh, than intellectually curious. Now I said some, not all, so don't, you know, don't, don't, don't kill the messenger on that one. Um, but I, they didn't always, I, I don't think I was able to engage them the way that I wanted them to be engaged in the classroom. And I also um, do leadership development and executive coaching, and uh, many of the executives that I've coached um, were sent to me at the behest um, of someone else, a superior, basically told them, you gotta go meet with this executive coach. And some of them um, entered the, the coaching relationship, I think, a bit skeptical uh, of me, of, of what I might be able to offer them, and honestly, of the fact that there might be anything that they could learn at all. Um, so my experience both teaching college students and, and coaching executives has been that uh, a lack of ability or talent is rarely the, the primary obstacle to learning. That it tends to be, I think, um, the greater obstacle is a lack of um, engagement with and commitment to the learning opportunity. So we learn when we're ready to learn, right? Um, we can't make people want to learn. Uh, we can't give people motivation, as far as I'm concerned. But I do believe that there are things that we can do that unlock the motivation that's inside of someone. Right? We don't give it to them, but we can unlock um, what's inside of them. So this morning, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you three things that I think um, can be helpful and that I've found to be helpful in my efforts uh, to unlock in others the desire to learn and the motivation to grow. So, the first one, don't start with what's wrong. Um, how do you feel when someone criticizes your work, or your approach to your work, or how you act at work? Um, if you're like me, uh, your first reaction may be a bit negative, you may be a, a bit defensive. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm not particularly um, happy when people criticize me, and I've been known, on occasion, to handle it poorly, let's just say. Um, now, contrast that with how you feel when someone asks you about what you love about your work, or how you derive a sense of meaning in the work that you do, or they ask you about your professional aspirations, your dreams, what you want to accomplish in your career. You feel totally different, right? You feel like this kid wearing galoshes, riding a tricycle. So, um, if you're like me, you're energized by that sort of conversation. I mean, I could talk for an hour about what I love about what I do, and I would be smiling from ear to ear um, the entire time. So, when we start with the critique, when we start by talking about someone's skill deficiencies or their knowledge gaps, um, we make them defensive. We will shake someone's confidence and will likely threaten a part of their self-identity that's really important to them. So, 
um, I suggest something different, which is um, we should start by learning about what somebody loves about their work and what they hope to achieve in their career. And only then, once we've developed an understanding of that, only then should we address their learning opportunities. That sort of sequenced juxtaposition, where do they want to go? What's important to them? What do they care about? Where do they want to go? And then, where are they today? That highlights a gap that creates a positive tension that motivates people. And I've, I've used this approach with people where I'm coaching an executive and I ask them about, and I really am interested in, um, what they care about, what's important to them, what are, what are they passionate about in their work, and what is it that they hope to achieve in the future. And then I'll provide them with some kind of feedback around what they're doing well today and maybe what are some opportunities that they can improve upon. And when I've used that approach, I've literally had people say to me, wow, I've got some work to do. You know, I mean, they, they, they sense that they're not where they want to be and that there's some distance or some ground that they need to cover. So that's the first thing. Start by learning about someone's passions, their purpose, and their desired future, and only then should we wade into their learning opportunities. Okay. Number two, failure should be framed as something that isn't only inevitable, but it's necessary for significant learning and growth to occur. If you were, you know, here for Micah's talk, or if you listened or watched any of the Creative Morning talks uh, on the topic of failure, this is probably going to sound sort of familiar, but uh, this is what I'd say. So I, I didn't earn anything less than a B the rest of my college career after that, that sophomore semester, um, except my final semester I did get a C in beginning guitar. I was, I was a short timer, you know, I was almost done with college and I'm not much of a musician, so. Uh, but I made the grades I needed uh, to get into graduate school and uh, I was admitted to Virginia Tech's doctoral program in industrial organizational psychology. Um, things went pretty well for me my first couple of years. I earned my master's degree uh, as part of the, the PhD program, but I was nearly kicked out of the program after a couple of years. Uh, my faculty essentially gave me a vote of no confidence. Um, they didn't want me to continue in the program, but I was given a reprieve. Uh, the department chair, in his infinite wisdom and with a, with a just heart, uh, allowed me to remain. But I was devastated. Um, I was, uh, by that vote, by the faculty telling me they didn't want me to continue in the PhD program. Uh, I was hurt. I was angry. I was embarrassed. Uh, my confidence was shot. Um, they had sent me a very harsh message, which was basically shape up, get your act together, and take this seriously, or you're gone. So I considered quitting. Um, I had a number of thoughts that ran through my head, like maybe I'm not cut out for this. You know, they don't want me here anyway, so why should I waste my time? Along with a few other kinds of thoughts, you know, kind of even there as well. But eventually, I was able to step back, I was able to put my anger aside, and I, I could look at things more objectively, and I realized something. They were right. Uh, I looked myself in the mirror, I turned my attention to their concerns, and I focused on what I needed to do differently. I focused on how I needed to change in order to achieve my dreams and my aspirations. And what I realized was that our failures challenge us. They challenge our assumptions about ourselves and our beliefs about the world around us. I realized that failures can serve as a catalyst for inside-out learning. And that is the most profound kind of learning there is. It's the kind of learning that changes how we think rather than just what we know. So I use that failure as an opportunity for some self-examination, and I think I was better for it. It changed the way that I thought about what it meant to be a good student, uh, to work hard, and to pursue the things that I cared about and that mattered to me. So that's number two. The third one is that I think we should make the moral case for learning. The psychologist Jonathan Haidt has done a lot of amazing work on a concept called moral intuition. And I'm a big fan of his scholarly work, uh, but I recently found out that he has a TED Talk. So um, if you like TED Talks, look up Jonathan Haidt. Uh, he's got a great one on there. And what um, Jonathan Haidt suggests is that most of us like to think of ourselves as highly rational, objective people who consider all the information uh, before we make a decision, like a judge. right? But what he says is, in reality, that's not how we do it. Uh, we tend to make quick judgments, 
And then we go in search of supporting evidence, right? We, we make up uh, our mind about something and then go look for facts that support uh, our judgment or our decision. So we're really more like defense attorneys. My, innocence, my, my client is innocent and I'm going to look for all the facts that support that. Okay. So, Height's work indicates that we make these immediate judgments based upon what we believe is right or wrong or good or bad. We make these sort of snap decisions based upon our moral intuition. So his work suggests that if we want to inspire someone, for example, if we want to inspire a student or an executive to embrace a learning opportunity, we should make a moral argument. And I'll give you two examples. One of them is sort of an accidental example that, um, that I encountered, and then the other one is a more purposeful example, the way I kind of use this in some of my work. So first, the accidental example. So I stuck it out. I stayed in graduate school. Um, and when I finished my coursework, I left campus and I began working. Uh, I was working in Charlotte, North Carolina as a consultant and with only my doctoral dissertation project uh, left to complete. One spring day I drove up to campus for my dissertation proposal meeting. Uh, I met with my committee and it was a good meeting. Uh, I presented my plan for my dissertation research and all went well until uh, we began hearing sirens. Lots of sirens. And my one day on campus for that entire year was April 16th, and it was 2007. Um, I don't have a lot of time today, so I won't share a lot of details about my experience of that day. I'll just share a couple. Um, my committee and I were meeting um, in the morning. I think it was 9 o'clock, so it was like 9 to 10 or so. Uh, and we were meeting about 100 yards away from where 30 people were being murdered in a, in a classroom or in a building. Um, my best friend at Virginia Tech was in that building uh, when, when uh, that tragedy occurred. Thankfully, he made it out alive and unharmed. And I remember we were on lockdown for a while, and, and when I was free to go, I went I checked on my friend. I met him in his apartment, and when he, I knew he was okay, I, I got in my car, and I was driving back to Charlotte, and I called my wife to let her know that I was okay. And I remember I, I began crying while I was on the phone. And the only thing I kept saying was, I just want to come home. You know, I just want to come home. My point is that I was affected by that day. Uh, not as deeply or as tragically as some, for sure. But the events of that day changed me. And I remember I thought to myself, life is short. Life is really short. And every moment we have is a moment to cherish. I didn't want to spend time doing work that was anything less than really meaningful to me. I wanted to do work that I loved. And while I didn't realize it at the time, I was really making a moral case to myself for changing the trajectory of my career. I argued to myself in favor of doing work that would enrich the lives of other people, uh, work that would help create healthy and happy and vibrant and meaningful work environments. And seven years later, I'm doing that work. I made a case, a moral case, to learn new things and to develop the new skills that I would need to be the professional that I wanted to be and to be the professional who could help make work life meaningful and successful for others. So I made a moral case to myself and I think I found it pretty compelling. So now the purposeful example. I frequently make a moral argument for leadership and for leadership development, which is basically a kind of learning, right? Um, I make um, that argument to the executives that I coach and the leaders that I work with. And the way I do it is like this. I paint a picture of what a great, uh, I paint a picture of a great leader as someone who, who serves, who inspires others, uh, who makes people feel safe so that they can do their best work. I paint a picture of a great leader as someone who holds themselves and others accountable and who rewards and recognizes and lifts people up and is someone who will make the tough decisions. I, in other words, I, I define leadership in moral terms, in terms of things like humanity and justice. And what I found is that when I frame leadership as a moral enterprise, it tends to resonate with people. It becomes sticky and attractive. It's the kind of thing that people want to learn more about, and they want to do better. So, in closing, I'll just say this. I believe we should inspire learners. Uh, from the classroom to the boardroom. I believe learning is a career-long 
and a lifelong process that can touch and enrich every aspect of our lives. I believe that taking the time to understand people's passions and their sense of purpose and, uh, and their professional aspirations before we offer a critique of where they are today, that framing failures is not only inevitable but necessary parts of learning, and that making the moral case for learning and growing and developing I believe all of these are approaches we can use to arouse people's intellectual curiosity and their motivation to grow, and I, I hope that what I've shared will be helpful for you as you think of ways that you want to try and inspire yourself or others to learn. And maybe we can all uh, be a little bit more like this kid wearing galoshes and riding a tricycle. Thanks.